I guess start all of this with I'm horribly sleep deprived. Uh, so if I'm not making any sense or anything like that, just stop me. Uh, really, the main thing that I want to communicate here is my excitement for this book, my excitement for FP. I think I can do that even in a sleep deprived way. Um, so hopefully I get that across. Now, the whole, but this talk is part of a series, so I just want to talk about the series a little bit and just explain why I want to do it, what it's going to be about, and how it's going to run. We're going to follow through this lovely book. Uh, it's by Paul Chisano and Runar Bjornsson, uh, and I think it's one of the best introductions to the fundamentals of FP. There's other books out there, but this one's really small. I've got it in my bag. <laughs> Tiny book, you can come have a read through it if you want uh, in the break. If you want to scan through it, figure out whether you want to buy it or not. But it's really small, um, but it focuses on all the nitty gritty details and things you're going to want to understand to get functional programming and be able to build your own functional libraries. Uh, and it does it by making you implement them from, from scratch, which is excellent because you learn all the little bits and how you make Scala work for this kind of thing. Uh, and you just happen to learn Scala along the way. It's not really a book about Scala, but if you want to learn Scala and you want to learn the good bits, the stuff that is useful for FP, it's a brilliant book. Because it's arguable when you, whether you want to learn the other stuff or not. I don't use it. So here is a content. Here's the, oh, what? That's not going to be good. Let's hope not too much it falls into this category of falling off the end of the screen. Obviously I zoomed in too far. Uh, so this is the contents, and as I, as I said it before, it just gives you, it, get it, it gives you a solid understanding of all the things, that, all the concepts you're going to need to be able to build your own libraries and to make them better, <coughs> and all the crazy things you need to do to change your program in the very fundamental ways to make FP pervasive through your application. There's a whole heap of stuff here, I won't talk about it all, but plenty of stuff. Um, ah, cool. Uh, so the target audience is basically anybody who wants to learn functional programming. Uh, it doesn't assume any knowledge. It's going to teach you everything from the start. It's going to teach you Scala syntax. Well, at least I'm going to try to in this talk. Uh, and really, it's it's it should be accessible to anybody. And I think that even if you're experienced with functional programming, there's a lot of good stuff in there that will force you to relearn things or maybe you've missed fundamentals that you'll pick up. Because certainly there's some things from real world Haskell or learn your Haskell that aren't, they aren't in those books where the fundamentals are in FP and in Scala. So it's really cool, there's stuff in there for everybody. Uh, so the course plan, it may be ambitious, it may not be, I'm not sure, uh, is to try and get through one to two chapters a meter. Some of them definitely won't be two chapters and a meetup because they're quite big, like the scary monads one and the applicatives and all that kind of thing. Um, but it really means we have nine months to the end of the year, uh, so we, whatever that means, we have to do so many twos and then we've got enough for single ones, which I think we can fit in. Um, and the plan is to, what, the book is heavily exercise based, so the plan is to, sorry, go yeah. The plan is to have the hack nights available to people for people to come in, do the exercises, work through it, and get lots of help. Because I think the most important thing with all this stuff is to have other people around you who are doing the same thing to energize you and get you working on it together. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, and I'll be available throughout the whole thing, through the whole year if you want. Email me, whatever. Uh, get people involved. There's plenty of other ways to get help as well. There's a mailing list for FP and Scala. There's a IRC channel on Freenode. There's obviously the BFBG Freenode channel if you don't want to ask the biggest scary group, if you just want to ask us. And there's this GitHub page which has all the exercises in a nice, easy to check out and run kind of form. Cool. So the desired outcomes, as I talked, it's to get people excited about FP, but also to be confident with it. I think that's the biggest thing. You can be excited about FP, but until you're confident that you can build a functional library and know these concepts, you're not going to go out there and say, let's do this and push it on people. So having that confidence is a really important thing. So I hope that at the end of this nine months that people feel like they're ready for that, because we really need a new wave of people willing to take functional programming to their bosses and 
make these nice little functional cubby holes like I've built at iSeq and there's stuff at eFoxes. They're beautiful places and we need more of them. So it's somewhat selfish. Like if there's more cubby holes that are functional programming, that's good for me as well. So it's good for everyone, hopefully. Um, and I hope to keep things interesting, like keep things interactive, do the exercises, get everybody engaged. I hope that it's not just coming to the meetups and not participating because you're really going to learn by getting involved and talking to people and experimenting, tinkering. Uh, and I want to get more Scala in the meetup group. I've recently changed jobs. I'm now a Scala programmer. I'm not Haskell anymore. So probably going to find more Scala in the meetups. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. Let me know. Uh, and probably the, the coolest thing, if people don't volunteer to do talks, there's going to be more Haskell Ryan Gosling memes. Maybe you don't want that, but I think they're awesome. <laughs> there is an entire Tumblr dedicated to these memes, so I have a big arsenal if nobody volunteers for these talks. <laughs> All right, uh, but this is a beginner level talk, so if there's anything that's not making sense, I'm talking too fast or whatever, please put your hand up. Cool, it's chapter one. What is functional programming? Why are we here? Good question. Uh, it's programming with pure functions, that's really all it is, but this statement has very far reaching consequences. So, a pure function is something that cannot contain crazy, naughty things like modifying a variable or modifying a data structure in place, setting anything, throwing an exception, or any IO. Um, and when you first get to this, it's like, how is this even useful? Every bit of our code. Our job is writing to files, it's reading from files, it's going to databases. How the hell do we write programs without side effects? Um, and it's all possible. The side effects are still there. It's just that we need to shift our thinking. Uh, and once you've mastered this, and the, this book will teach you how to do this, um, you will be able to write the, your programs in a, in a, that do exactly the same thing, but in a much more modular and reusable way that you can reason about. Um, so we're just going to work through a little example here to kind of hopefully demonstrate that. All right, so let's straw man OO. Uh, this is the, with the pathologically bad OO demonstration. It's terrible. This is not how anybody programs OO, but it's a good thing to pick on. So we need to make a method called buy coffee, which we pass in a credit card and it's got Rotan, some kind of coffee. So we make our coffee, uh, we charge the card, whatever the price of the cup of coffee is, and then we return the cup. But that's pretty gross, uh, because it really means we can't test that thing. We, we can't run this function without actually going off and charging the credit card, which is pretty ordinary. We don't want that as, like, we need to be able to test code. And really, nobody even writes Java code this way. There's this whole swaths of things that are dedicated to write, writing code that doesn't do ugly things like this. So really, what we what we what we're more likely to have is something like some kind of payment service where we can abstract away this um, side affecting thing and then we'll change our charge so that we're just calling this interface for payments and doing nothing there. Because then, the, then what we can do is we can mock that payments interface, just separate that from the credit cards and do our nice testing stuff. But then what happens if, if we need to make a function that buys multiple coffees? Do we... It, it, we can we can make n instances of our buy coffee, but is our customer really going to be happy if we charge their credit card 12 times for 12 coffees? Probably not. Uh, this is a really contrived example, but it's it goes to show that even even by making things nice and testable in a nice separated interfacey way, we can still get ourselves into situations where. The caller can't control our side, the side effects that are happening in this function well enough to be able to reuse it in the way that they want. So I think that the main point here is that I'd argue that side effects are anti-modular, like because the, the controller doesn't have any the caller doesn't have any control or control over these. If somebody wants to write an abstraction that uh, some for some reason decides not to change charge the credit card, maybe it's a discount thing or something like that. It's very hard for them to do that, but still produce a cup of coffee. Uh, and it, it makes it makes the, the, our code really hard to reuse out of the way, uh, in ways that we didn't expect as the library implementer. 
And really, I think if FP is one thing, it's, it's about pushing these bounds, it's pushing these effects to the outside of our program so that we can, we can maximize this kernel of pure code that we can do nice things about and reuse in a modular way. And this entire book is dedicated to techniques that will make this happen. There's a lot. I'm not going to say that it's easy. If you, there's a lot of pages in here just to tell you how to relearn how to program. That's hard, but hopefully um, by the end of this course you will appreciate the benefits and realize that it's probably worth it. Or you won't, and at least you'll know really objective reasons why it doesn't work for you. That's a good thing too. So let's, let's, let's do our first functional kind of programming step. Uh, so let's, we'll, we'll change our credit card. Really, I should point to this one, because that's where the camera is. Oh well. Uh, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to change our buy coffee. So instead of actually doing the side effect of charging the credit card, it's going to return two things. It's going to return the coffee that we made and some kind of description of a charge that needs to happen. Uh, and this, this crazy thing of parens here and a comma there is just a tuple. It's just a fancy way of returning two things without making a unique type for it. In functional programming, there's lots of different reasons why you'd want to pass two things into a function or get two things out, or three things. There's tuples up to 24 or something like that. So for ad hoc cases, that's what they're there for. Uh, and that since here is just returning our carpet and our charge, as we said. So this, this kind of turns everything on its head, and it gives the, the control over charging the credit card back to the caller to allow them to abstract over our code in ways that we wouldn't have expected. Um, but first, let's look at how we've defined the charge. Um, so, and this is explaining a bit of Scala syntax along the way. So we have a case class is just, it's a class definition that has um, a constructor and all of these attributes here are public, which you can get to by going charge.c or charge.amount. Uh, and in the body of this class definition, we can create functions. Um, and a function is defined as this. So we've got inputs and we've got our output, and then we've got some kind of function definition down here. So we can grab our credit card, uh, and if we're combining a charge with another charge, then we're always going to have to make sure they're the same credit card, otherwise, we're going to be doing weird things. Um, and then we can use the copy method of case classes to explicitly say, I want a new charge, but only change the amount. So we're adding the two amounts together and returning a new charge. Uh, and for now, there's going to be stuff in later chapters. This is bad. You never want to do this, but we're keeping things simple for now. If we get to the case where we've got two different things, then we're just going to throw an exception for now. We'll fix that later in chapter four, I think. Ah, here we go. Uh, so that, that's going to come in chapter four, and we, there's more generalized lawfulness of the, a general pattern of appending things together and adding things in chapter ten. So I guess the important thing to take out of that is, while things look like they kind of suck right now and a bit a bit basic and annoying, there's more magic coming later. So bear with the process. Cool. So now we, if if we need to um, make our buy coffees method with our new and improved functional by coffee, we can give that a well. So we do what we did before, we make our, our list of by coffee return values, which will return our list of tuples of coffee and charge. Um, we can call a method on the list called unzip, which just takes, it takes a list of tuples and returns a tuple of lists. So it kind of just turns them on its head. Um, because then we can get out all the coffees from our return and all the charges. And we can use the function called reduce, which just calls our combined function pairwise along the accumulated value that it's seen before and the next one. So at the end of this, we get a list of coffees and a single charge to the credit card. And here you can see we never actually get that exception because there's only one credit card anyway. But exceptions are still bad. Cool. So really, we, we're, at, we're at a point where we've been able to reuse the code and, and extend it without having to worry about these side effects. So this is really a success. Uh, looking through my list. Cool. All right, uh, so here's just a diagram. I think I've talked mostly about this, but 
really, if we, if we change our thinking from having the side effects in the, the code that we want to test, the codes that we want to extend, rather than jumping over here, and separating this, so still having our logic in here, but deferring those side effects to here, we can get ourselves a code that we can reuse a lot more and, and build upon rather than having to worry about these side effects or re-implement interfaces, trying to apply the side effects in different ways. Because the important thing here is that the side effect is an explicit thing that we're returning rather than this vague thing that is just off to the side. Well, that's why it's a side effect, right? So just giving that control over to everything else improves things astoundingly. Cool. All right, are there any questions at this point? Cool? Cool. So really, make, making this charge a first class entity of it's, our thing is now returning coffees and charges and treating that side of, well, the effect of charging the card as a first class entity obviously makes it more reusable, as we said, but it also increases our reason, our ability to reason about that function. If we can, if we can see in its type that it's returning charges, then we we can know that it's doing the it's creating charges without having to dig into the code and find these hidden side effects. Um, and when you're looking at a piece of code, trying to decide whether you should re reuse it or not, and it's 10 layers on top of everything, that's a really important thing. If, you just look, if you're just looking at one little function, it's very easy to see that, hey, there's a side effect in there. But when you're looking at bigger code bases, it's very important to be able to pick any bit out and say, I know exactly what you're doing. I know exactly what to give you. I know exactly what it's going to give me back. And this is how I can reuse it. And this just makes things safer to reuse in general because it's very clear what it's doing and we're not going to get any weirdness by trying to compose things together and reuse things. So there's no surprises. I hate surprises. Um, cool. So really, what are we talking about with a pure function? We've been very hand wavy at the moment. It's just no naughty things. But let's, let's define it properly. So a pure function is something that goes from type A to type B and maps every value of type A to exactly one value of type B. Um, and it only does that based on the value of A. And not some external state, it doesn't go off to a database. For the, any given A, it will always return the same B. Uh, and an example of that is interstring. If you give interstring 5, then it's always going to return the string with 5 in it. You expect that. You have an intuition of what a pure function is, but we're making it a proper thing and trying to make more and more of that code pure so that we can reuse it. And the key to all this is something called referential transparency. This is a bit long-winded, but an expression is referentially transparent if, for every program, P, all occurrences of an expression E can be replaced with the result of it without, without affecting the meaning of P. We'll get into exactly what that means in a tick. But a function F is pure if the calling of it with an X is referentially transparent for every value of X. So an example of this is if we have the expression 2 plus 3 and 2 plus 3, then that's exactly the same as 5 plus 5, and that's exactly the same as 10. Um, being, able to, being able to substitute the return value for the actual expression itself is key. Because uh, we'll get to that. The one, the one important thing to, to make about this is that if we need to cheat, so if there's performance reasons why we might want to use a mutable array, inside this expression we may use a mutable array, as long as that mutability doesn't escape the function. So if, you, if you're doing everything in line and you're doing like a bubble sort in a mutable array, that's a crappy example, you never do bubble sort for performance reasons, but if you did, then as long as you returned an array that was immutable and no other thing could, observe ch could ever observe a change to that from something that wasn't a return value, then it would still be referentially transparent. That's a weird kind of 
edge case of this definition, but it's really important to, it's not just about getting rid of immutability. We can use mutability, but only when it's contained, when it's modular. So if, if we go through the, it's pretty obvious, but we'll go through the, the simple thing of how the, our 0.1 version of CAFE violates referential transparency. So we create a cup of coffee, this credit card charge, it, it does its side effects and returns unit, but at this point we, we discard the value of this uh, and it's just lost into the ether. So the only thing we return from this function is cup. So if the return value is just new coffee, clearly substituting a call to buy coffee with a credit card is not the same as new coffee. So it's, it's obviously not referentially transparent. Whereas if we look at our 2.0 version, which is the new and shiny functional version, uh, obviously our buy, our buy coffee, which expands to our, coffee, our new coffee and the charge, which is just a pure non-side affecting thing, is exactly the same. So if we, if we mixed and matched those, if there was some kind of abstraction that changed those around, it wouldn't be a big deal. The reason why this is important is because coding with pure functions allows our brain and our code to make these equational substitutions. Uh, and just, it, it, it allows you to reason about that function in a way that's local and doesn't require you to load up all the different ways that state can change through your application, which is really, which it really allows us to create code that can be understood and reused independently of having to understand the whole code base. You can just look at a function and say, yep, that is the one for me, I know I can use it. So we, at that point we can, we can do novel abstractions over things, we can refactor, we can optimize, and we can compose our code with very predictable results just based on the function type, which is really what we want out of all of this. This is super important to me because A, I'm lazy and I want to write as little code as possible. So having something that will allow me to reuse code in a way that I'm not terrified of. Like sometimes reusing JavaScript code is terrifying because it does weird things. I don't want that. Uh, because I'm busy and I, I really want to come back to the code that is crazy and abstracted and I want to understand it completely when I change it later and quickly. Uh, and my brain is really small, so I can't get lots of stuff in my head anyway when I'm programming. So I, I need this to help me out so I can write bigger and more interesting bits of software because I can forget about all these little things that I'd have to keep track of in Java land. Um, but, but really, I think the, the, main, the main reason why I, I, I love functional programming is so that I don't end up feeling like this all the time. It's a homage to the movie that's coming out on Thursday. Um, cool. Uh, I think that's really important because human brains are completely valuable. We make mistakes all the time. So if we can write code that makes it harder for us to screw up, that's really cool. All right. Uh, so at this point, any questions about FP? Anything? We'll get on the Scala, so don't worry about the Scala stuff too, too much at this point. Cool. All right. Cool. Uh, so really, this this chapter is a primer, both on Scala and just how to write functions. But it's not really about Scala. Uh, it's a, it's about the minimum set of Scala that you're going to need to survive this book. Uh, so if you really want to get the programming in Scala book, it's like this big, and just talks about all the objects and stuff like that. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, yeah, we're going to be writing Scala. We're going to be writing pure functions in Scala. So let's get some practice at that. Uh, and some of these, some of these concepts are really gnarly. If you don't know what they are and you haven't seen them before, they're really scary. Uh, and I'm not going to lie in that regard. But don't worry if they don't sink in now, because they will sink in gradually. Uh, it has been a very long process for me. Uh, I think anybody who's learned functional programming, it's been a long process. But I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't rewarding. So do stick with it. We're going to help you along through this year uh, if you're interested. Uh, I would do the exercises, and everything will start to sink in as you do more and more practice with this kind of thing. So don't worry too much. Cool. So 
a bit of Scala stuff. An object uh, is is a it's a, it's a singleton. So stuff that you, the value that gets created here is a singleton. There's only ever one of them. So this is where this is the equivalent. All the methods in here are equivalent to static stuff in Java. Um, so you put stuff in here that's not going to reference your charge object, all that kind of stuff. Functions are public by default. Uh, they have a parameter list, the colon, we have a name for it, and then it specifies what the type is. And then we have another colon to specify what the return type is. The return types are optional, uh, but for public functions, you probably don't want to omit them because Scala does do type inference, but you don't want to test it too much. Uh, so we have we have if expressions, and I say expressions and not statements. So each each branch of this if expression has to be the same type, because it's going to return either value of that branch. Um, if you leave that else, it's unit. There is a hack. Yeah. But unit doesn't, doesn't exist. Else. You shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> uh, cool. Cool, cool. Uh, we get, there's also private functions. If you need to make a private function, they're there. There's package accessibility as well. If you want to only have functions accessible on your package, but don't worry about that right now. Um, and if you've got more than one expression in a in a function, you need to denote that with braces. Um, we've got string interpolation. Don't forget the S. I forget the S all the time and just get strings with $X in it. Uh, or a lot of this code uses the old school uh, string.format way. So I would use the string interpolation. It makes more sense to me. But you'll see this everywhere in the book. So I just put both of these in here. Uh, if we're going to create a variable, we create it with val. There is var, but pretend that doesn't exist as well. Uh, and this just used printf stuff. And then we can go string.format with the two things that we want to interpolate in there. Cool, cool. Uh, and to just like Java, there is a main method, which takes an array of arguments, which are the array of things in the command line. Uh, and this function is always, it always returns unit because the whole idea of main is to boot up, do whatever the program's gonna do, and then terminate. Um, cool. Print line, calling our function over here. All apples, except for the fact, if you forget this equals, and you're going to do that when you learn Scala, it automatically makes this function unit. And you will get very annoying and weird things if you leave that equals off accidentally. Here it's okay, but if you ever get weird stuff of this thing here is expected to be returning int, but this is unit for whatever reason, it's probably that you forgot this equals. What does unit mean? Sorry, I should have. I even have that in my notes. I'm an idiot. Uh, unit is void. So it's a unit is a type which has exactly one value, which means you're returning a type that you don't really care about that value is because there's only one possible inhabitant of it. So you're just saying. Eh, I did something. Thumbs up. That's that's what it's saying. Uh, cool. Cool, cool. Uh, we can run our code. Uh, if you really want to just, if you really need to just run a single Scala file, you can. You can run Scala C on it, and then run Scala my module, very Java style. Or you can just run the Scala itself, and it interprets it essentially just compiles it to not a file in the directory and runs it. Uh, so either one of these, you need a main method, because it's going to look for the main method and call it to run that code. But we can also just jump into the REPL. So if we just type Scala anywhere, doesn't matter. It's probably You probably want to do it in the directory where the code is. Um, we can load up that mymodule.scala, uh, and it will automatically load up that file, compile it, and give you a symbol called my module that you can call stuff on. So that now we can do, now the next thing you, you might want to check what the type of my module.abs is. But unfortunately, this fails. Uh, and what you'll quickly, you'll quickly have to just realize that 
there's a difference between functions and methods in Scala. It's weird. It's because it extends from Java and there's overloading, all that kind of stuff. So to bring this method, because this is a method on an object, which is a Java, op a Java object, into the function scope, you have to put underscore there to partially apply it and bring it out into the function space. This is really annoying, uh, but Java compatibility, so it kind of has to be there. Um, so if you ever get this, just put the underscore on there, you'll get the function type back. And we do that here, and this is what we kind of expect. We want to check the type of ABS, and it's obviously int to int. Cool. Uh, and we can even run the main. Uh, I normally, if I'm doing this kind of thing, I'll probably just be in the REPL running these kind of things, because it's just easy. You can reload the file again, and it'll reload everything and not crash, so it's quite handy. Uh, and there's also a paste mode. Uh, which will be very useful if you're copying and pasting stuff from the internet. So you can, you just type colon paste and then it will give you a nice buffer that won't do weird things with new lines. And then you just control D to finish it. And it does what you expect. Cool. So to get into this, we're going to have to talk a bit about namespacing because, sorry? Oh, Samuel, how did you get the syntax highlighting there? Oh, oh that's, got like a yeah, nice coloring. <laughs> that's just highlight JS. Oh, never mind. I don't know what it's assuming that that buffer is, but it looked pretty, <laughs> so I didn't change it. It's just auto detecting that, so uh, whatever it's doing, it doesn't look horrible. So why not? Cool. Uh, so namespacing. Obviously, in most, pretty much any language, you're going to need to import functions from somewhere else and use them. Um, so we're going to talk about that. Every Scala value is pretty much an object, uh, which is either declared with val or object. So object is a way to make a sort of global singleton. Val is a way to make your variable in whatever scope you're in. Um, those objects act as namespaces that you can import from. Uh, and really, Scala makes no distinction between like the case class charge that we created before and the object my module. You can equally take a charge instance and go import cc underscore and import all the, the public variables into the current scope. So there's no, the, the, there's, it's actually very consistent if you're going to give it anything, uh, but it can be a little crazy. Um, so we can access everything inside of an object with the uh, dot operator, just as we did before. We go cc dot number or whatever it was. But we can also import the symbols from an object into a current scope using import. So we can call mymodule.abs, which we did, but we can also import mymodule.underscore, or we can import mymodule.abs to just import abs explicitly. Underscore imports everything. Is that in the room? Yeah, that's good. Uh, and then we can just call that, because that, that function is in scope now, well, method. Um, it's in scope now, so we can call it. Cool. Uh, and another thing is that in Scala, there really aren't any operators. Um, the somewhat syntactical hack is that any single arity function can be called just with spaces in an infix position. So if we look here, we can call my module abs42. Um, that doesn't really make sense. I don't suggest you write your code like that. But one plus two, it makes a lot of sense. Because really, what this is under the hood is just one dot plus two. Um, so there are some cases where using this infix notation will be useful. It makes your code a bit cleaner. But if you see anything out there that does this kind of thing, know that that's what it is. Uh, if it makes you kind of uneasy, just replace the dots. and. It'll look normal. Cool. So now we're going to get on to something called higher order functions. Um, and really, that is just a fancy name for a function that takes another function as an argument. Uh, it's really nothing more than that. And writing and uh, using existing higher order functions will become something that's incredibly useful and something you'll do all the time as a functional programmer. Um, and it'll make a lot more sense once you get into it and really start using this stuff. Uh, the most notable higher order function that probably everybody's used, it's in JavaScript, it's in Ruby, it's in Python, is map. 
uh, which is just a higher order function over a collection that applies that function to every element in the collection and returns a newer collection with all the transforming elements. So we can do our listing of this list of numbers with ABS and it returns one, two, three. Cool, but we're gonna make a slight detour because we need to be able to write code without loops now because the traditional way to do a loop is to make a mutable variable and then loop over your whatever you've got and then mutate that variable. We can't do that anymore. So we're gonna make a slight detour and talk about how we'd write loops in a purely functional way first. Uh, so we're gonna go through an exercise of implementing factorial where that is just, it takes a number and then returns an, in, and returns an in such that the return value is x times n minus one all the way down to one. Uh, and we're gonna do that without a for loop immutable variables like we used to. So we'll start off with exactly how we, we expect. We're gonna take our int and return an int. But we're gonna, re we're gonna use this, this concept called the helper method, which is basically a fancy way of writing a recursive function that has our normal loop variable inside of it. Uh, and then we just update that on every recursion down the list. So, <coughs> well in this case it's not a list, but we're going towards the base case. Uh, so obviously our base case is if n is, my, is less than or equal to zero, whatever thing we've accumulated to this point is the result that we want. Uh, otherwise, what we want to do is do our n minus one step and multiply our accumulator by n. Uh, and then we want to kick off our helper function. The book doesn't actually do this. It defines factorial wrong, which bothered me, so I fixed it. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, it doesn't deal with negative numbers. Because <laughs> the original case was this, and it just passed in one. So we return one for any negative number. Screw that. We can make it work. Uh, so what this does is it, is it calls our absolute on our initial number to kind of normalize it to a positive number that we can actually approach our base case with, and starts our accumulator either at negative one to make the result negative, or one if it was positive. Probably a bit of a hack, there's probably a better way of doing that, but I couldn't put a wrong version of factorial up on my slides. I'm sorry. Um, so this is doing, this does exactly what we, we need it to. It accumulates this value, but if you're thinking in terms of stack and the fact that every time we recurse in a normal stack-based language, we, can, we make a new stack, and then go down and make a new stack and go down for each instance of our recursion, this is probably a bad thing. But, do I have that on the next slide? Yes, I do. But Scala has something called tail call optimization. And what, what we're saying is that when a recursive call of a function is in a tail position, if it does nothing but call return the value from the next step in the recursion. So if you look here, our go, uh, the result of the, what we return from this is either ack or it's go. There's no lingering uh, computation to do after the recursion terminates. So what Scala can do uh, is optimize this into a while loop so that you don't consume stack for every element of your list or every recursive step. And you can annotate functions with annotation.tailrec to make the compiler enforce this. It will actually be a comp compilation failure if this, doesn't, if this isn't the case. So if we implement a tail recursive like this, which is kind of the more mathematical way of doing it, except that it's now the broken one. Uh, actually, did I fix it? Yes, I did, because I get the ABS in there. Uh, but if, if, we, if, if we define factorial so it's n times the result of the recursion, then obviously we can't optimize it down into a while loop. We have to have a stack element for every bit of the recursion. So this will return a compilation fail, failure, which is a really important thing to have if you're writing your code and not use loops, but you want Scala to actually make it a loop under the hood so that you can feel warm and fuzzy, then you really need this, this uh, condition to be held. Cool, so now we've done, we've kind of gotten rid of loops and we can do that functionally, so let's write our own higher order functions. 
Okay. So, if we ever found ourselves back at that my module, and someone had implemented these two functions, which are woefully copied and pasted, except for a few little things. And those few little things are obviously two functions. Ah, uh, and a bit of text, but that's okay. I couldn't make it highlight because it's already highlighted by the highlight.js. Uh, anyhow, um, and we just wanted to, it to print line the two, the two results of this. Pretty boring, but obviously if we can't fix this code duplication, then we've lost already because that's pretty simple. We should be able to fix this. So let's do this. Um, we want to make a function called format result, um, which obviously takes that number, but it's going to take a few extra parameters. Firstly, it's going to take that name to interpolate into the string, and now it's going to take a function parameter. Now, this is this is kind of new, and it's just saying a, a variable f is a function that is from int to int. Uh, and I didn't put a return on type on that, but that's probably okay. <coughs> So now we've got the message, just as before, except we've got a new parameter. And now we can format and interpolate that name and calling this function with the value of n. So now that we, when we can abstract this out and just call our format result with the abstracted way. Cool. Uh, but that's also pretty, pretty boring. We want to take this abstraction even higher. So, to this point, we've only ever written monomorphic functions, so they're, they're functions that are hard-coded to specific types. But if we're really going to take this abstraction to the next level, we want to be able to write types that can work over any type, because we don't actually care about that type. We just want to work over some container of any type or something like that. So that we can take the abstraction up a little higher so that we can get more code re reuse. I mean, this is exactly the same as Java and GRX. If you ever tried, well, if you can remember coding in Java 4, it really wasn't very fun. Uh, <laughs> and I don't want to ever go back there. Salesforce Java doesn't have generics. It only has generics in their specifically implemented collections. It makes me sad every time because I can't write polymorphic functions. It makes me cry. But still better than next week. <laughs> um, cool. So, so let's just get on to this. Say we want to write a function that will return the first index of array that satisfies a predicate. Uh, so let's 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 just do this. Oh shit! I'm gonna break myself. Um, so we want to write this find first so they can work with any a. This a in square braces is just a way to say. I have a type parameter, and it's called A. From that point, the A is just a, it's a type, but it's not something we have any information about, so we can't actually do anything with it. Except we can define a function that the caller has to satisfy that it gives it, it can take an A and then return a boolean, so that will be our predicate of, is this the thing we're looking for? Uh, and obviously we need an array as well. And then it's going to return the int index of what we're going to find. So we use our friendly annotation.tailrec because we don't want to accidentally consume stack. And our base case of our recursion is if we pass the end of the length, then we're just going to return negative one because we haven't found it. Again, there are better, more functional ways of not returning negative one, but we're keeping things simple for now. Otherwise, we're going to call our predicate. Um, on the taking the nth array element out of the array. Now, I guess it's an interesting, an interesting thing here is that this, whenever you see a variable and then just parens after it, if you're going to try and look for the method in their source code, you need to be looking for a dot apply. Um, it's some Scala syntactic sugar that if you take any 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 object and then just put parens after it, it'll go looking for the apply. There's a few weird things like that. Unapply, when we get to pattern matching, is the the inverse of that for destructuring things. Um, so if you ever need to go code down and look for that, because you want, this isn't a constructor or anything like this, it's, it's weird and off to the side. And it's not immediately obvious when you get into Scala. So this is getting the nth element out, passing it to our predicate, and if that's true, we return what our current index is. Uh, otherwise, we keep looping to the end. 
and then we kick off our loop at zero. So we can we can we can uh, call our find first now with we're not going to bother de defining a, a function with an actual name on in an object or anything like this. We're just going to make it anonymously. So for to make it an anonymous function without a name, you need you can do it two ways, but this is the simplest way, which is just parentheses your your name for your variable. The types are optional, but especially when you're working the REPL, there's not enough information for the Scala compiler to figure out what type you want. So if you're working the REPL, always err uh, on putting way too many types on things, because otherwise it's not going to infer things, and you might think that it's broken when it actually isn't. In fact, that's a common problem with programming in Scala, but that's a future thing that we'll get to. Way too many types is often just enough. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you'll learn to apply enough types when you're writing Scala code to, to kind of get the right happy place flat. But in this case, we definitely have to let it know that it's a string, otherwise it gets confused looking for subtypes and weird stuff. So we are defining a, a, an anonymous function here that says x is a string, and it will return true if x equals the string b. Uh, so obviously this returns the index 1, do the same thing for ints. And now we, we, we've written our function that is both higher order, so it's taking a, a function, and it's polymorphic, so it doesn't care about what's inside the collection. So that we, we don't have to write a find first int and a find first string, which you would have to do if you were in Java 4 or in Salesforce or whatever <laughs> sad place you were having types but no polymorphism. Um, we can also, uh, yeah, you can also use underscore to kind of make an anonymous function where underscore is the, that's where the thing is, like it's the same as going x, x here, but in this case, we're back to the point of it not having enough information to figure out what this underscore is, so it doesn't really work, but you can give a, <coughs> You can always fill in the type parameter on the function, which then fills in this guy and this guy and this guy, which means that everything's everything's sort of set there. So there's no weird stuff for the compiler to have to figure out. It won't work in the REPL, but would it work in the normal code? Yes, because there's normally enough information about the collection. Uh, yes. Is it smart enough to actually make sure that the array you're passing in, which is full of strings, and when you pass in the second function, actually takes a string? In the place of the underscore? Or yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah, is. It is. Yeah. yeah. So this is all compile check, and that's why it gets that's why it gets angry at you when it can't figure out enough information about the types because it can't actually say that that's a good function. Yeah. It is, but it doesn't have enough information to give it a thumbs up. Um, but yes, everything is completely compilation checked here, so that you can't write something that will accidentally get an int and crash. Um, cool. Cool. Last pointer before we finish up here. Could be pretty good for time. Um, types are your friend. Um, not only do they prevent you from doing silly stuff and doing things that you shouldn't be doing, they also are a really good guide to help you figure out what to do if you're trying to implement something that's very foreign. Um, and if, if you've got a very weird and rigid type, especially one that's highly polymorphic, Normally there's only one or two different ways that you could even take the next step when implementing a function. So if you really pay attention to them, like say in this case where you're trying to uh, make the method unobtainium with three type parameters and this AA business and this function and returning an, an, a function from B to C, like, if you look at that and you're not used to this kind of stuff, that seems completely crazy and you don't know what that's supposed to do, you don't even have an idea of how you would implement that. But if you look, the hint here is that our return type is a function from B to C. And because things are polymorphic, we can't possibly know enough about that type to create a value of it. So there's no way that we can pull a B out of nowhere to, to do something here. So the only option here is for us to make a function that takes a b. And from this point, 
if we have a function that takes a b, then we have an a in scope, we have a b in scope, and we have a function from a to b and returns a c, and we need this function to return a c, so the only possible thing that we can put here is fab. And this is the only possible implementation of this function without going off into crazy land of coercing values or reflection or anything like that. But for the purposes of functional programming, we pretend those things don't exist because we don't want to use them, otherwise it breaks down all the nice things that we're trying to prove about our code. So don't be scared about the types. The types are actually there to help you. Cool. Summing things up. We learn a lot. We learn how to write functions. We learn how to read their types. Well, hopefully. We learn how to run these things through Scala C and the REPL. Uh, we talked a bit about how namespacing works and that methods and functions are weirdly different and it'll probably mess you up. But if they do, then know to put an underscore there or just ask somebody. Because the easiest way is just ask somebody because they've been through the same pains. Um, We've learned how to write tail recursive functions instead of loops and make sure that they are actually tail recursive so that we don't blow up our stack when going down our list or doing whatever we're doing. And we've learned how to make higher order, not only higher order, but polymorphic functions as well. That we can just abstract crazily over things and make functions that are highly reusable that don't really care about the types too much and allow a lot of customizability from the outside. And we've talked about how to make anonymous function both with underscores and with fat arrows, and hopefully talked about enough of the limitations in the REPL when there's not enough information there. You will get the same effect if you're writing lots of functions without return types, because if you don't give enough information to the Scala compiler, things might go a bit weird in one place and you'll get your type error over here when really it's over here. Because if you've done something funny here and you've returned an int and a string, which then Scala thinks you're returning an any, which is just anything, and then down here you've got a weird thing about any when you don't have anything of the sort in that regard. So be careful of that. If you ever get weird compilation errors, try adding more types, like encode your assumptions into the types of you, like your return types of your functions. And you might find that your code's actually correct and you just needed to help the Scala compiler along. Um, and finally, hopefully we learned to follow the types when implementing an exercise. Um, and you'll get better and better at just thinking, well, I've got this, so that means I need a this or a this. You get better at making those lateral jumps of exactly how to play this Lego game of composing functions together and building bigger and bigger more awesome things. But that's a whole lot of stuff. Scala is huge. We didn't even get into all of it. Don't worry if it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's probably not going to make sense, at least right now. So please work through the exercises if you if you're unsure of Scala and you want to continue on with this. And you're most welcome to come to the hack night and work through it. Otherwise, if you can't come to the hack night, it's fine. Uh, just hit us up on IRC or the mailing list or anything like that. Um, and you can email me directly if you don't want to broadcast something out. And worry about it. But that's the end. Uh, the slides will be up if they're even useful. Uh, the video will be up at some point too. Uh, the book, I'd highly recommend buying the book because following along with a study group and you don't have the book might be problematic. Uh, and the exercise GitHub is really cool because you can just check it out. It's already ready to run with SBT and good to go. Um, so, And it also has answers if you're the kind of person that gets stuck but would rather look at the answer rather than asking somebody and sounding silly. But you never sound silly, you're actually learning the process. So. There's never silly questions in that regard. Because everybody's probably made the same stumbling on Scala when getting into it. Uh, and yes, I am looking for volunteers for further chapters. Uh, I haven't quite figured out whether there's a Ryan Gosling for every chapter, but it might happen if we don't get volunteers. So please, if you're interested, especially if you want to learn something, I'm quite happy to mentor someone uh, reading the chapter, understanding it enough to be able to get up and speak about it.
And we also provide uh, practice runs and feedback yeah. talks. So if you kind of want to put your time in the water, but you're not sure, we can help you make it happen. Yeah. So we're always there. You can give us the slides, and we can give feedback. We can do lots of dry runs. We could do a dry run every week of like that month before the meetup if you really wanted to. We're there, and we're <coughs> we do any, we do pretty much anything to to give a new speaker a chance if you really want to make that jump because that was the times that has definitely been the times when I've learned the most uh, out of anything here. Just getting up and trying to think like you know what you're doing. Um, is a really powerful, powerful thing. Uh, so thank you. Are there any questions? Is there anything like with Scala that suggests types? You know, like how Haskell has got like a type whole thing. Is there anything in Scala that would suggest what type you need? Uh, I don't think so. But if you don't have something to put in a, in an expression, you can always put question mark question mark question mark, mm. uh, and you can it will just satisfy the type so that you can implement other things. Uh, sorry? The only uh, way to do it is just putting the type you know it's not. Yeah, if you put it, I, yeah, I always... Oh, oh, send me a hint and you really need this one. Yeah. <laughs> the you go. Sometimes it can give you a very helpful, unhelpful type though. If it ever tells you object with serializable, it's game over. It doesn't have any information. It's pretty much saying it could be anything. Do you use daily recursive a lot? In your work? Uh, not really, because as we're going to see in future things, people have written abstractions to abstract over recursion so that you don't have to do recursion like this. Um, so no, but it's an important thing to learn and get the fundamentals. A lot of what we learn in this entire book, you're learning fundamentals that people have already written libraries from for, but understanding exactly how they work is really important and getting those fundamentals there. So it, it only gets better because you can start using all these bits of code that smart people have written already. And that's exactly what Scala Z does. Like, yeah, you pretty much don't have to write much because smart people like Tony and Runa have already written it for you. And it's reusable in the same ways. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, we'll thank Ben and then pizza.